Amen. Thank you so much, Casey and the team and Laura for leading us so beautifully. And good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sure you'll be forgiving of me taking the liberty to have a bit of a stool today. I thought if there's any excuse being 35 week pregnant during the middle of summer, I don't know if it's a pregnancy thing or just like an adult thing, but I feel like I'm spending 95% of my time at the moment just thinking about when I can next lie down. <laughs> so, um, Yay for stools. Um, it, that said, it really is a true joy and a privilege to be able to, to be up here today. I, f- I feel like I say it every time, but it truly is a joy just to be able to look out and see so many beautiful faces and just to be thankful for the gift that it is um, to be able to, to gather together. Um, I, I f- I always find whatever's going on in my life, whether big changes or just the ordinary humdrum, um, that coming to church is such a great time to kind of look not just, you know, up from my own life to look at who God is and also just to be witness to, uh, to the lives of everyone else who is not me, which is a really great thing. So uh, praise God for that today. And I wonder how you are going today, how you are really going. Um, I don't know if you you know those people um, who will ask, you know, how are you? How are you really? Because in Australia, I think we can tend to have a bit of a tendency to be like, oh, I'm fine, I'm good. Um, But at this time of the year, uh, we've sort of come off the back of, you know, a busy season. We've got a lot going on. Um, Like many others, I really do tend to enjoy that downtime after Christmas, you know, that time when you're not really sure what day of the week it is. It's uh, it's quite lovely. It can be a really hopeful time of year. Uh, If you're a goal-setting type, hands up if you, uh, you know, appreciate a good goal or a resolution or... It's always interesting to see, yeah, yeah, a few people who've been thinking about the year ahead. Um, so it can be a really lovely, less busy time of year to be able to to stop and reflect and to think through, I think as Casey put so beautifully, where we want to focus our hearts and our minds and our energies this year, um, to think about what we might want to or need to prioritise perhaps. And even if you're not, it can be a really lovely time to slow down for a little bit to um, maybe read a little bit more or just watch a lot of Big Bash League, um, enjoy the longer, warmer evenings. Um, Perhaps you're back at work and you're getting your mind and body back into, you know, the normal everyday routines. Um, As has already been acknowledged as well by Casey and Laura, it's been a, a different summer for us as well, I think, in a lot of ways. It has been a summer of heavier hearts than usual here in Australia. Um, As we all know, it has been a time of record-breaking drought and high temperatures, and with the already difficult factors of those things for many people, we've also been coming to terms with this ongoing sort of rolling reality of devastation of widespread bushfires throughout Australia, um, including here in SA and especially um, our beautiful Kangaroo Island. We have seen swathes swathes of bushland and properties and people and wildfire impacted and destroyed. And I think it is really helpful for us as a community to acknowledge that we are lamenting that, that we are grieving that. Um, In myself and those around me, uh, particularly, I guess, you know, scrolling through news feeds and on social media and, um, you know, all the various platforms we have and just chatting with friends, uh, I've seen a whole range of really understandable and very normal reactions to to such things. Um, Really tangible fear, uh, deep anger, disbelieving frustration profound grief and even just numb disengagement, particularly as this is an ongoing kind of thing. So I think it's helpful to acknowledge that in our community, to acknowledge those kind of emotions and responses. As Christians, I think it's interesting for us too. We, We serve a God of beautiful redemption who throughout the most awful of circumstances brings light into darkness. And I think in many ways we've seen um beautiful light being shone into this darkness of this situation in Australia. Again, as has already been acknowledged and I think is exemplified beautifully in Kelsey this morning as well, there's been an outpouring of extraordinary selflessness and giving in our um, Australian community and in our global community as well. Um, I found it really humbling actually just to see there have been millions of dollars um, donated, sorry. People have been raiding supermarket shelves to be able to donate goods uh, to fire-affected people and areas. Areas, and we've, of course, seen this uh, unbelievable hard work and sacrifice of our fireys and their families and so many other people who are vol- volunteering and working in relief and recovery in response to look after um, people and animals. 
So we've all been impacted in different ways, I think, whether directly or indirectly, by the events of this summer. And uh, following unfolding events and even getting involved in different ways has made up a lot of the um, a very real and consuming part of our lives over the past weeks. And then there's the news of Harry and Megan as well. I mean, there's just a lot going on. It's all happening as we sit here at the beginning of 2020. <laughs> So in our global situations, in our national situations, but also in our personal circumstances, in our own ordinary lives too, I wonder what is happening in your life, what you're anticipating in the year ahead. I think we all have our different plans and hopes and fears and expectations about what the year ahead may hold. And so as we look to the future, as we sit here in January, and uh, maybe I'm just exemplifying sitting here, you know, looking ahead to the year in, um, from January to the year of 2020, in many ways we do face the unknown. What will 2020 actually hold? We just, we don't know. We don't know. And so as followers and disciples of Jesus then, I wonder what God might be saying to us now, today, at the beginning of this unknown year, if we just stop to hear from him and reflect. As followers and disciples of Jesus, what even is our prayer as we look to these global and national situations and in our own lives as we're poised at the beginning of this year? What will our testimony of 2020 be? Through January at Enfield, uh, we have our beloved Hour of Power services where we do uh, still try to keep things real and anchoring and looking to God, uh, but short and sweet as well. Um, last January, I preached on Psalm 23, which is a really beloved and profound psalm and really stayed with me throughout last year. And so it actually seemed right to return to the Psalms again today. Uh, and in a moment, we're actually going to spend some time sitting in a psalm that's pretty close by to Psalm 23, uh, Psalm 36, and consider what God reveals to us about himself there and about ourselves and what we can hold on to at the start of this year. Now, Psalms is a unique book of the Bible. Uh, it's a book of musical poems. It's beloved to many. Um, these poems have been collected, or songs even, have been or were collected across a range of centuries and it has a range of authors, including Moses. Many of them are by David. Um, they're full of beautiful images and metaphors and colourful emotive language. Uh, and these are expressions from the authors to God and about God in the context of various circumstances. And I think one of the reasons people love it so much is because it's a very human book. Um, the full gamut of emotions are expressed. There's no sort of like, oh, you're not allowed to feel that emotion. Um, it's just all out there from every nook and cranny of the human soul. There's anger expressed, shame and fear, uh, overflowing and even reckless joy and praise. There's frustration at injustice. There's doubt. There's thankfulness. All the words of Scripture are used by God to reveal himself to us, and the words of the Psalms are used by him to help us express and relate ourselves to him with honesty and rawness and vulnerability. There are a whole range of different types of psalms as well. There are quite a few psalms of lament, actually. Um, psalms of thanksgiving, psalms of praise, salvation history. Uh, but the psalm that we're going to read today, Psalm 36, is a wisdom psalm. So it's kind of similar to the book, perhaps, of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes in um, the way that it's kind of structured and its purpose. Uh, and it looks at what it means to live life wisely and the merits of a wise life. And so we'll be using this psalm to be able to consider as we sit here at the beginning of January, uh, well, yeah, beginning of January, beginning of 2020, how can we approach this year with wisdom? Uh, so with the genre and the purpose of this book in mind, I'm actually going to read through the psalm twice, quite slowly, to allow us to linger in the words. Um, I think God's words are always going to be more powerful than my own. Um, so the first time that I read it will be for familiarity, just to sort of hear it, uh, read it. The second time I'll ask you to look out for something in particular. And I also invite you to consider what would best help you to take in this psalm, what might uh, you find helpful. So I invite you to close your eyes if that is something that you find helpful to be able to, again, focus your heart and mind, or to look up the psalm in your own Bible or on your own app, on your own screen. Um, I'll also have the words up on the screen as well if you'd like to follow along there. So, let's get into it. Psalm 36. 
sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. Everything they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely or do good. They lie awake at night hatching sinful plots. Their actions are never good. They make no attempt to turn from evil. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights. For you are the fountain of life, the light by which we see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. Don't let the proud trample me or the wicked push me around. Look, those who do evil... Sorry, those who do evil have fallen. They are thrown down, never to rise again. So I'm going to read it through a second time. And as I do so, I invite you to pay attention to any word or phrase or even invitation that might feel particularly weighty uh, or important to you. And this is going to be different for everyone, I think. So as we read through, just sort of let it sit with you, see what feels weighty or important to you. Sin whispers to the wicked, deep within their hearts. They have no fear of God at all. In their blind conceit, they cannot see how wicked they really are. Everything they say is crooked and deceitful. They refuse to act wisely or to do good. They lie awake at night, hatching sinful plots. Their actions are never good. They make no attempt to turn from evil. Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the ocean depths. You care for people and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your unfailing love, O God. All humanity finds shelter in the shadow of your wings. You feed them from the abundance of your own house, letting them drink from your river of delights. For you are the fountain of light, life, the light by which we see. Pour out your unfailing love on those who love you. Give justice to those with honest hearts. Don't let the proud trample me or the wicked push me around. Look, those who do evil have fallen. They are thrown down, never to rise again. So there's quite a bit in that. I wonder which part spoke to you. Let's dig in a little to what we've just read. So this uh, particular psalm or this musical poem, it does it seems to be structured generally in three sections. So kind of as is laid out on here. So the first section, verses uh, one to four. I wonder how you found that. It actually I find it quite confronting as it starts with a pretty strong description of a person who essentially has turned away from God, as it says, "Sin whispers to the wicked deep within their hearts." In verse 2, it describes how they're blind to themselves. They can't even see how wicked they are. We we don't even really use the word wicked these days. Um, I don't know, do people still use that in like a cool way? I don't know. I've given up trying to work these things out. Um, And in verse 3, their every action is tainted by this. And in verse 4, there is no even intention in these people at all to change. These aren't the type to have New Year's resolutions of, all right, I'm really just going to focus on God this year. 
So it's a very black and white description of a person that kind of need, leaves no room for shades of grey. Um, I would probably, if it was myself writing this psalm, I would feel a bit more comfortable saying, you know, having a bit of a, oh, he had his faults, but it was, you know, he was a good guy overall kind of approach, um, which I think is probably a pretty Aussie or modern way of, um, of going about it. But this is often the way with wisdom literature, where they um, use quite strong language to, to really make a strong contrast. So we see this um, also all the way through Proverbs as well. Um, and so they're making a strong contrast between, particularly between what wisdom is, which we'll look at in just a second, and also what folly is or uh, what it looks like to, I guess, essentially not live life with God. And so that's kind of the first part of the psalm, setting it up, having a look at this person who really overall just seems consumed by having turned away from God and by evil and wickedness. So not a super light start. <laughs> Um, but that does set us up. So the next section, um, round about verses 5 to 9, um, we might actually expect David, who is the author of this particular psalm, to then go on to describe what the life of a wise person might look like. So, okay, this is what a wicked person looks like, therefore this is what a wise person does. Um, but he doesn't actually do this. Instead, as the author, I think he actually maybe models what a wise person does, and he actually switches the focus to God, who God is. So he describes God as being, um, in his beautiful, you know, really rich and visual ways, um, as being unfailingly loving and faithful in verses 5 and 7, as righteous and just and caring towards men and animals alike. I know that was a particular verse that struck me as we've seen this um, widespread um, wildlife destruction as well in Australia. It describes God as being a place of shelter and kind of abundant nourishment as well in verses 7 and 8. And in verse 9, um, as the very fountain of life and light by which we see. So the author kind of switches from this looking at, you know, this life of a person who's just consumed with um, things that aren't of God to who God is and just how beautiful that is. And then lastly, in the third section, kind of verses 10 to 12, uh, he responds to these characteristics of God that he's just reflected on and articulated, and he actually turns them into prayer, asking, pour out that unfailing love on us, God, that um, give that justice to us. Please don't let me be trampled by my circumstances, all these you know, evil forces around me. David prays these things to God. And finally, um, at the very end, David finishes with a note of victory. These sources of evil have fallen, not him. And so David moves through these motions, I think, to demonstrate what wisdom looks like. He paints a picture um, uh, of a, what a person who was turned away from God does, and then rather than describe a wise person, he actually demonstrates what a wise person does. So a wise person doesn't dwell on trouble and rebellion and self-absorption. A wise person actually dwells on who God is. They intentionally and deliberately and even with discipline turn their eyes and their hearts to think about the personality and the character of God. So then a wise person is one who dwells on God and responds to God. Now, there's so much in what David dwells on about who God is, I think, in this psalm um, that can be a real comfort to us as a community, both in our big picture situations here in 2020 and also as individuals in each of our own situations. Um, as we face the unknowns of 2020, how incredible it is that we can, sh uh, that we can and do actually know who will meet us in every situation. We know a God whose love is extravagant and stable amidst all this you know, uncertainty in this world, perhaps in our lives. That stability is amazing. Who has gone to extraordinary lengths to be present with us and will never leave our sides. A God who is righteous and just and who knows and feels the depths of the wrongness and the impact of, e of sin in our world. A God who is not standoffish or stingy or manipulative, but offers shelter and nourishment abundantly to give us more than we need from relationship with him and his good creation. 
He wants us to actually grab the biggest cups that we have to fill up from his river of delights. I really love that, partic- that um, verse in particular, that river of delights. One of um, Gideon's favourite things at the moment is just water play in general. So um, we're sort of making, learning all the rookie parenting mistakes of what happens if you give a two-year-old a hose and just say, you know, have fun, see how you go. Um, and he just, he loves it. He's got his little watering can, he's got a little, little paddling pool and he'll just spend, um, you know, as long as he can really, just puttering around there and just enjoying water. Um, and I, I just love that, that picture of what it is to really delight in water and in God's creation. And I wonder if it's a similar sort of, well, they're the sort of picture that I get from, um, from that phrase, river of delights. Uh, it's kind of like um, a couple of Psalms earlier in Psalm 34 verse 8, David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Not just confess that the Lord is good or reason that God, the Lord is good, but actually taste and see. It's this invitation to not just know intellectually about who God is, but to, to actually taste and see and experience that abundance. And so what incredible truths for us to hold on to with David. And we're even better off than David. Unlike David, we actually know God um, through the person of Jesus. Jesus was who um, David and so many others in the Old Testament were looking forward to. And just like God's river of delights that is described here, um, and being the very fountain of life. Jesus describes himself kind of in similar watery imagery in um, John chapter 4, verses 13 to 14, to a Samaritan woman at the well. He says to her, Anyone who drinks from this water will soon become thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So it's that similar picture of abundance and that similar picture of um, being able to get all that we need from God. So we don't know what our years will hold, but we can trust the one who will meet us in every situation the year will bring. He promises to never leave our side, to love us unfailingly and give us what we need uh, in abundance. I think there's great profound truth in that to reflect on. So these are incredible truths about who God is and perhaps it is these truths about God's character which you are needing to hear today, whatever your situation might be. But I think in taking a bit of a step back, there's even more for us to see here as well. I think there's actually an implicit challenge from David. So this is a wisdom psalm. It's painting a picture for us about what it is to actually live a wise life So David has laid out for us this contrast in verses 1 to 4, the person who is not wise and who lives their life steadfastly uh, with their back to God. Perhaps distracted, um, but it certainly seems like this is quite an intentional thing. Compared to the person of verses 5 to 12, who is wise in that they actually choose to look to God and then to respond to God by asking for his love and protection. And so what is wisdom? It's consciously recalling who God is and responding to him. As we said at the beginning of 2020, I think we actually have this opportunity to consider what it is that we're choosing, um, our daily habits perhaps in our ordinary lives and which posture towards God we're actually taking. I love this quote from someone called Annie Dillard where she says, how we spend our lives, sorry, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. Sometimes it can be easy to get caught up in these, you know, these big picture hopes, but actually it's sort of just in the nitty gritty daily habits um, and routines that we have that actually shape us and shape who we are and shape the bigger picture of our lives. And so in our daily lives, where are we actually remembering who God is and recognising where he is at work? Where are we inviting the Lord in? Are we turning away from God, like the first person that's um, depicted in this psalm, distracted and with no intention of turning back towards him? I would um, anticipate that, I guess, as we are actually all here today, we've chosen to be here today. Um, you know, there are aspects, perhaps, these are very black and white examples, so we might be more shades of grey, I guess. We have all actually chosen to be here, and so in doing that, we have chosen to turn to God in some way. Um, 
But are we, I guess, to the extent that David demonstrates and models, are we actually choosing to intentionally and deliberately and even with discipline turn our eyes and hearts to dwell on the personality and character of God and then respond to him? I know for me, um, you know, particularly for us, I guess, going through a bit of a change in seasons, I'm anticipating become a, becoming a mum of two and all the kind of chaos that that might look like. And so thinking through well, what will that look what will that look like for me to actually, you know, in the middle of exhaustion and 3 a.m. wake ups and all that kind of stuff, what will it actually look like to dwell on God and respond to him in that, to actually take up his invitation to receive in abundance all that I need to get through each day? So we will be striving to spend time in his word, even if it's just a small part of our day, alone and with others, so that we can actually drink from his river of delights. We don't read his word to earn points from God. Um, There's nothing that we could do that could make him love us more or less. Um, But it's an invitation to drink from his river of delights. Will Will we be coming before him in prayer, alone and with others, in order to honestly express ourselves, as the psalmists so beautifully do, to dwell on him and respond to him and just come to him in rawness and vulnerability and openness to receive? Will we be um, investing in and committing in time with our church family on Sunday mornings and in small groups? Um, Before we know it, small groups will be starting up again soon. Um, Already we've sort of put our names down um, or had that opportunity to and... um, We'll be able to, if you haven't yet done that, there's, you know, it's not too late. Uh, but you know, as we sort of sit in January when everything slows down for a bit, we can decide how intentionally we want to enter into that and commit to those sorts of times of community in order to, again, drink from that river of delights um, and in any other ways that God might be calling us to. I recently read this book um, called Liturgy of the Ordinary. I don't know if anyone else has come across this one. Um, often this is my, or after Christmas, I sort of like to read, you know, whatever I've received for Christmas. This is one of my, um, my Christmas presents, which is lovely, um, by someone called Tish Harrison Warren, which is just a great name. Um, And it really beautifully looks at how God is actually in our everyday moments. Sometimes we do have these hearts, these big, you know, grand um, life-changing things, I guess, in our lives, Um, but actually recognising how God is in the ordinary, in the everyday. If anyone would like to borrow it, you're welcome to, by the way. Uh, so, you know, the teeth brushing, the bed making, the, um, the losing the keys, the commute to wherever it is we're going, getting stuck in traffic, um, the in-jokes that we have with friends, um, checking our email inbox, the texting a friend, the uh, uh, enjoying what we find lovely or pr- pleasurable or delightful. Um, and for me at the moment, that's lying in our hammock at sunset to read for those moments I get the chance to do that. All these moments actually reflect to us and can reflect to us something of who God is and who we are before him. So the Lord is and will be in all of the big things this year ahead, whether it be life changes or tragedies or illness or new life or death or job loss or financial difficulties, whatever it is, we know the God who will meet us there. And he's also in and cares about all of our ordinary moments too. And we have this opportunity to consider our posture towards God as we go into those times. God is with us here now, and he will be here for us and with us for every moment of 2020. And while in many ways we don't know what the year ahead holds and can't know what the year ahead holds, what we can choose is through his Holy Spirit in the faith that he has given us to live our lives wisely as reflected in this psalm, to look to God and respond to him. And so how will we choose to look to and dwell on and respond to our Lord this year? What will our testimony of 2020 be? We're going to pray now. And I invite you to join me in coming before God in honesty and in vulnerability. This God of unfailing love and faithfulness and righteousness and shelter and care, um, this God of abundance and light and life, let's come before him now as we consider the year ahead. Let's pray together. Father God, You are here with us right now. It's easy to forget that, Lord, but thank you that we have that assurance whether we feel that reality or not. Father, we thank you for your holy word and that you have chosen to reveal to us who you are and who we are through it. 
We thank you, Father, that you are unfailing in your love, that you are faithful, you are righteous and will see through justice, that you care for us, humans and animals alike. We praise you that we can take refuge in you and that you invite us to drink from your river of delights, that you are the fountain of life and light in the darkness. We come before you, Father, at the beginning of 2020, and we ask that you would help to make us wise. We thank you, Lord, that you gently invite us every single day in your grace to come before you. We thank you, Lord, that you already know the steps and the missteps that we will take this year. And Lord, that does not change your invitation and your grace. We pray that, Lord, this year you would help us to dwell on and to remember who you are and respond to you as we have seen in the wisdom of this psalm. Lord, incline our hearts to do that. And as we are at this time of the year where we can reflect a little bit on our habits and our just daily ordinary lives, help us to see the invitations that you are giving us to do that. Help us to work that in so that we might be wise and choose to dwell on you intentionally and to respond to you. Father, we ask that you would show us in ways that we each understand where you are inviting us to drink from your river of delights in our circumstances. Thank you for the assurance, Lord, that we might, know, we might not know what that actually looks like right now in each of the circumstances that we will face this year, but we do know that that invitation is there, whatever we face, that you will be meeting us in whatever we face. Continue to encourage and guide and bless us, Father, so that we might be more like your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>